So let's begin with some introductions. And even if I have been introduced, uh, I've been brought up in a way saying when you meet new people, you should introduce yourself. So that's me. I sometimes have a beard. I sometimes don't have a beard. And I work at the University of Bristol, which is there. And Bristol is famous for all sorts of things. The first thing being that if you go to Bristol, you'll notice people don't speak normally. They speak like pirates. And secondly, if you go to a pub in Bristol, you'll drink cider and not beer. And cider is made of apples. If it's made of pears, it's called perry. And apples come from the county of Somerset, which is just south of there. And if you go even further south, you end up in Dorset. And Dorset is a very interesting place in the UK. It's really, really old. It's where some of the oldest settlements in England have been found. And scattered along the Dorset countryside are these things. There's these man-built mounds which no one really has figured out where they actually come from. Uh, and there's lots of them. And they took a long time to build, so apparently they were important somehow. So you can do some interesting statistics on these. So, statistics. So, first thing you can do is that if you take... This is the mound in Upmin Evershot, Upminster, and I can't remember what this one is. These are some of the biggest ones there is. Clearly, you connect those three, and you end up with a triangle. Now, if you walk towards the next one, that's on each side, you end up with an interesting pattern. So you end up with something here, where these two sides of the triangle are equally big. And you can keep doing this, and the pattern keeps emerging. And this is quite an exact pattern, how these are connected. And what you can also do is you can walk north of this. And if you do that, you end up exactly at the entrance to Wells Cathedral. And Wells Cathedral is a lot newer than these mounds, but it's still an amazing precision that you end up there. So now we have to draw some conclusion from this data. That's what machine learners do. So clearly, the people who built this need to have a really, really big expertise in math that was way ahead of what we think it is. So the first conclusion is clearly British people knew about math way ahead of the Greeks, right? So who taught them that? Well, one thing you can think about is that an alien race landed in Dorset and taught these people this, right? This is a theory that this person has which is called Tom Brooks. He has written a book called The Geometry of Britain. And he believes that because he managed to connect these together, that clearly, it says here, it's actually from The Guardian, where he does not, all this suggests the culture existing in these islands in the past, quite outside our expectation experience today. He does not rule out extraterrestrial help. So, the even more interesting thing with this pattern is if you go up to the East Midlands, you find exactly the same thing. However, that's connecting Woolworth stores. <laughs> so, this is from the Bad Science blog. And the idea here is, it's a guy called Matt Parker who did this experiment. We know so little about ancient Woolworth store, he explains. But we do still know their location. I thought that if we analyze these sites, we could help learn more about what life was like in 2008. How these people went about buying cheap kitchen accessories and discount CDs. Matt Parker in The Guardian. So, you didn't expect me to talk about these things, I believe. But what I've actually done is that I've talked about the absolute essence of what we do. The absolute essence of machine learning. Because what I just formulated for you here was the no free lunch theorem. So, this is the essence of everything that a machine learner does. So, these mounds are actually in exactly those places. No one can argue with that at all, right? What we can argue with is the assumptions that you put in when you analyze this data. Your hypothesis that we put in place and then we say this is a way to explaining the data. 
And there is infinitely many hypotheses that you can choose from. And I possibly don't agree with aliens being there. I say it's possibly due to something else. And that, to me, is the no-free lunch theorem. So this was best articulated by this person, Simon Laplace, who I think is the father of machine learning. And you've probably heard of Laplace's demon. So in his book, uh, Philosophical Essay on Probabilities, which everyone should read from 1814, he says, an intelligence without a given instance knew all the forces acting in nature and the position of every object in the universe, if endowed with a brain sufficiently vast would to make all necessary, and listen to this word, calculations in terms of intelligence, could describe with a single formula the motion of the largest astronomical bodies and those of the smallest atoms. To such an intelligence, nothing would be uncertain. The future, like the past, would be an open book. This is usually what people read, and then they say Laplace was a deterministic. He believed in a deterministic world. Then you flip two pages, and it says all these truths in all these efforts in search for truth tend to lead the mind continuously towards the intelligence we have just mentioned, although it will remain infinitely distant from this intelligence. So what this means is that if you do machine learning, what we actually are interested in doing is learning about stuff that we're uncertain about. Truths you don't learn, you accept truths. So there's nothing to deal, do there. What we're interested in is stuff that are not true. And in order to reason about them, we have to make assumptions. Right? And what Laplace is saying, it's naive to believe actually that anything is true. So, the most interesting assumption that he said, apparently this might be an urban myth, but Napoleon asked him, you've written this huge book on the system of the world without once mentioning the author of the universe. Well, Laplace said, I had no need for that assumption. Later, when asked about this, he apparently said, oh, well, that's a fine hypothesis. It explains so many things. Okay, so one last thing before we get into the meat of this. So the scientific principle is exactly based on the no free lunch theorem. So we say a hypothesis and then we test this hypothesis on data, and we use that to say we can verify or not our hypothesis. If we do not do this, if we use to observe data and then come up with an hypothesis to explain this, then we end up with what Noam Chomsky calls the inductivist fallacy. And that's a very dangerous spot to be in. Cool. So what are we going to do today? So my aim is to talk today a little bit about, first, Bayesian non-parametrics in general. Then I'm going to move that on to GPs in specific. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Dirchler processes. Then I'm going to lead that on to how you do inference in these types of models. And then, based on the inference scheme, we're going to see this allows us to do certain quite cool things. I'm going to explain a set of models, a set of assumptions. And then in the end, I am going to talk a little bit about some specific assumptions and some rather confusing things that they lead to. So, Bayesian on parametrics. And you're more than welcome to stop me and ask questions continuously. Yeah? So, let's be a bit formal. So, the task of machine learning is given some data, I now want to describe this data by placing a probability distribution over it. So if I know this distribution, we say I understand this data. So now, why is the data that I have? And it comes from some space Y. So now, what do we call a model, the previous thing? A model is a subset of some probability measure on this space. Okay, so then this measure here is in the, or this model is indexed into this probability measure by a parameter theta 
that comes from some parameter sp space t. So that's how each model is indexed or parameterized, if you want. Okay, so we can look at a very, very simple case. I have a linear regression here over four basis functions. And in this case, here I just show the posterior distribution over this. In this case, I have four parameters. So this space T is just R4, and any parameter combination I pick here will be theta. Right? Any of these four parameters. In this case, that mean line has just these parameters. Okay? So that is what we call a parametric model. So the next thing would be to say, well, here I got the same data, but now I got loads of nonlinear functions here. So now, if I want to specify, I want to have a model that's capable, that should contain all possible nonlinear functions. I can always come up with one nonlinear function that has one extra parameter and one extra. So that makes this parameter space infinite. And because it's infinite, we then call it a non-parametric model. Yeah? Clear? Cool? I hope so. So, exactly, if t is finite, infinite, we call it non-parametric, and if it's finite, we call it parametric. So the easiest example of this is, of course, of a non-parametric model, is the nearest neighbor model. So now I have some training data, pairs. I have y, and I've got some label associated to them. So at first I got two points, or I got one point, and now the parameterization of this model will just be each of these data points. So now I can keep adding models, data points, right? And the complexity of this can grow, and I can add as many as I want, so therefore we call this a non-parametric model. So because we also have to use Bayesian, the word Bayesian in front of non-parametrics, the stuff that we will deal with today is when, instead of making a point estimate of this parameter, we treat this as random and place a distribution over it instead. And what we seek is the posterior distribution of this. So, the first thing then, and this is my introduction to Gaussian processes, is that we should try and figure out a prior for nonlinear functions, or actually a prior for functions in general. So when you think about priors, we don't need any data. So here we have a two-dimensional space. So now we need a probability distribution over this space that contains all functions. How do you parameterize that? Like, how does that distribution even look? I don't know. Okay. I, I'm good that I'm seeing confused faces because I have no idea. So let's do things a little bit simpler. Because everything isn't a function, right? If I draw something that goes like that, it's not a function because it loops back on itself. So let's think instead. Can we think about what a prior would be of the function at this point? Because now we know something, right? What do we know about every function along at value 6? We know that it can only pass once, and only once, right? That's the thing that we know. If it passes this twice, it's no longer a function. So we know if we could specify a distribution along here, that would kind of make sense, right? Now we have something that we can say something that's functioning. Okay? So how would that distribution look like? That's a bit trickier. So the way I usually think about this is that now let's say I observe this point at 1, 1. So now what would you guess if you had to guess? What would the function value be at 6, if that is definitely a point on the function? So guess. 1? I think that sounds very sensible. I probably would have guessed that as well. If I've only seen one thing ever, I possibly think it's the same. Okay, good. I 
like your intuition. So, so now I see at 5, I see the point value 2. So what do we think now? So you are thinking that there's like some form of slope going here. Another way would be thinking, yeah, I'll probably guess two, because I think that one's closer. That's another way of arguing. But all these are, yeah? I've got for five. You go for five. I like it. Yes, very, very good. Um, why would you go for five? It's off the chart. Yeah, exactly. You are, uh, you are in there. So I think at least everyone, except for Mark, <laughs> somehow made a reasoning by saying, well, when I say something about the function value here, I take what the previous function values are into account, and I make some form of argument based on that. <coughs> and you possibly did as well. I just can't get five in my head. I, I could find a quadratic function there. Oh, you can absolutely do, but if you would have to guess, right? I wouldn't bet money on it, but I also wouldn't exactly. bet money on it. I wouldn't bet money on two either. You wouldn't? No. But if you had to bet money, what would the value be? Well, it's like 100% probability I lose that money. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Is that because it's me asking the question? No, or because you're not going to hit that function value exactly. No, that is absolutely true. But, if, yeah. If you wouldn't have a range, then we can just... Okay, if I would have a range then, <laughs> so larger or smaller than zero. Larger. Yeah, okay. Five is larger, yeah, no, no, no. How come? Well, everything is larger than zero so far. Okay, so then the reasoning holds because what you're saying is that you're taking these two data points and making a reasoning based of what the function value is here. And that's kind of where the point where I wanted to get to. So now, if I now give you that point, then now possibly. If that now moves, say, infinitely close to that, would we say that this one is potentially more informative of the value at 6 than this point? Possibly, right? Cool. So then the thing that we've actually said is smoothness, right? That's pretty much what, every, what that reason is. One form of smoothness or the other, either as in I think it's a line, or I just think points that are close, but the gradient doesn't actually change that quickly. Okay, so you can encode that behavior really interestingly, or really simply. So if we look at just the normal Gaussian distribution, if we think of what these elements are, the covariance elements, if we look at that joint distribution, and then we take a couple of conditionals, we can see that actually, if now the covariance isn't particularly high, we can see for value one, I get a mean which is 0 0.5. So it follows the mean, but not particularly much. If I take something that has a huge covariance, and I'll get this. So now I have something which, if it is 1, the mean of the conditional is also 1. right? And if they're independent, it doesn't matter. right? So now the idea is, if I say I encode the distribution my prior according to this one, used as a Gaussian, and then I say each of those points along here co-vary because they're jointly Gaussian. Right? So I say I basically take a Gaussian and say each slice is Gaussian, and this point and this point, this slice, co-varies according to some function. And the behavior that you encoded, where you said, actually, I think if it's very close together, they're probably similar, that just means that they co-vary a lot. So if I now pick a function that computes such that it says, if this distance is small, the covariance between this slice and this slice is very, very big. Okay. So what we've done now is that we've actually encoded a prior of every possible function. Because if I put a Gaussian along this slice, it has probability mass at minus infinity and plus infinity, and I can draw that slice anywhere here. <coughs> so that means in the whole infinite plane, I have non-zero probability, 
And if I now gave you 10 and ask you, can you please draw a function that doesn't lie on this infinite plane? I don't think you can. So therefore, I now have a distribution, a probability measure, over every possible function. And those things we call Gaussian processes. Um, so, are we okay with this? Yes? What is that? Yeah. As long as you have a valid covariance function, as long as you have a valid covariance function, you're fine. So, for example, what you could do, simple things like you can have periodicity, right? You can have one covariance function here and one covariance function there. You could do that. It would be a bit tricky to get if you want the continuousness in that because there will just be two separate things in that case, if they don't covary at all, right? But as long as you have a valid covariance function, which is the same class as Mercer kernels, you're fine, right? I, I can do, actually knocked up a very simple UI to just show exactly these things. This is exactly the plot that I had before, where here I have my red slice. Now I made one more slice, the green one here. Then what I do is that I've placed, I say, I've observed at this one, I've observed y to be 1, which means I now have a covariance which is computed based on these two values, the x values, gives me this shape. Then I take minus 1 and I take the conditional distribution over that. That is now the conditional distribution. This here is the distribution of what I think y is along this. And now I can, if this works, I can, for example, move this, right? So now you see this thing here becomes like super, super correlated. So now I pretty much know what that one is. I can move them apart, and I get the factor Gaussian. If I move y here, so if I move this one up, the only thing that will happen here is I slide this one there. Do, 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 do. Bo, 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 bo. like that and now if I want let's see if this works I can draw a sample from that that was not a particularly interesting sample let's make it covary on a shorter scale like that these are now all samples from this infinite dimensional Gaussian if I wanted so I've just taken loads of these x's, and as soon as I've taken a set of x's, I've parameterized a Gaussian, because now I have a fixed parameter set. So now I've parameterized my probability measure in my model. Now I can sample from that model, and that's what I get. Cool. If you want your modern, I can give this go. It can be quite fun to play around with, I think, potentially. So I can hand that over. Cool. Good. Do, 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 do. So, now we have a prior over functions. So I have something which says what I think likely and unlikely functions are that I can encode according to that covariance measure. So, now I want to put this to use. So I want to put this to use somehow. So. Normally, we have a regression model, so I have some output data, I have some input data, let's assume some additive Gaussian noise, so that gives me this thing, that allows me to formulate the likelihood. Now, the thing that we were actually done, we said I can't parameterize this thing, but I can specify a distribution on what the function value actually is according to each slice. So, what we actually have, we've introduced a random variable, that is the value at the specific x. So I'm just going to call that this. And now we have what I like to prefer, like to call a handle to specify our assumptions with. So now I have an object which encodes functions. Dependent on how I set its parameters, I encode different functions. I make different functions more likely or less likely. And this thing here is what allows me to learn. Because if I give you three points, 
and say fit the function to it, you can find infinitely many functions that pass through there. If I give you 400 million points, you can still do that. It doesn't matter how many points I give you. And that's exactly the same as the mounds down in Dorset, right? You have to make an assumption first, and then you approach it to data, and then you might be able to say something. Now, a Gaussian process allows us to formulate our assumptions about functions. And then we're in the business where we can actually do some learning. Okay? Cool. So now, if we formulate the full model of this, so I now have some input data, which I really wouldn't want a distribution over. I have this term here where I use theta as a means of encoding the actual parameters of this covariance. So this now would be my prior, and I have a likelihood this will be the full joint distribution of this. So now, this is also mathematically incredibly simple, because if my likelihood turns out to be Gaussian, my prior, as soon as I evaluate the prior on a set of points, it's no longer infinite. It's now just a Gaussian distribution. Convolving two Gaussians with each other is trivial, and it becomes a Gaussian. So that's very nice. I can compute the marginal distribution super easy. So that distribution is now a parameterization of my data where I've taken into account all the assumptions that I made. Right? And similarly, the predictive distribution, if I have, want to know the function values at some x star, actually doing base rule like this is also trivial because Gaussians are self-conjugate. And this thing here appears in the mean of. So it's actually trivial to compute this. You can now get the marginal and you can get the predictive posterior. So that's fantastic in closed form. So this is actually quite an amusing thing that you can do this. And I can't often highlight how important or how cool conjugacy is. Because this object here. Uh, oh, sorry, this object here, when we're integrating this thing here, we're actually summing over every possible function that exists. And that we can actually just write down that integral by a little bit of linear algebra is very, very cool. Cool. So let's just show an example of this. So here I have a prior. So I say I think the function in general is zero, and I have some variance around it. Now, this is the actual function that I'm going to start seeing values from. So you show what actually happens when we learn. So I see one point. Cool. So now we see close to my data, because I have a covariance function that prefers smoothness. I get this, that the variance tightens up and the mean goes up there. I see another point. Same thing happens. Dunk, 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 dunk. And that's exactly how the learning would proceed in this case. So you see data, and also, as soon as I get away from my data, I go back to the prior, which makes perfect sense, because that's the prior assumption you encoded. You said, if I'm really, the closer I am to the data that I've seen, the more it tells me about where I am now, and the further away I get, because that's what smoothness is, it says less. So then you just have to go back to your prior assumption. Cool. Dunk. So now we have this infinite dimensional measure. So that was the Gaussian process. As soon as I evaluated this on a set of data, I get a distribution. And as soon as I evaluate the distribution, I get a value. So does these things exist for everything? Well, there's something called Kolmogorov's existence theorem, which defines which distributions actually have an infinite generalization. I'm going to talk about two DPs, and I'm going to also talk about Dirchlet processes, which are possibly the most useful ones. So the way we used the DP was that I formulated this process by saying, this is the covariance function that I have. 
Then I evaluated at a specific set of points that I was in interested in. That gave me a distribution. Now I'm down to single normal land that I have distributions to work with. So now I can evaluate this distribution. I can do whatever inference that I want. So it's just normal, simple machine learning. So this GP is defined over an uncountable in infinite space. Because the index set of the real line, you can't count. So how about if we have countable objects instead? So the example of that would be something like this. So here, I have some data, and now I want to learn a Gaussian mixture model of this. So if I want to do this, how many clusters should I have? I can have three, I can have four, I can have five, I can have six, and that was as many as I generated. But you don't really know this a priori, right? And if I specify a parametric model, this is something that I have to set. I have to know how many parameters it is, because I need to know the cardinality or the dimensionality of the space T. We don't want to do that, because that's a huge assumption to make, and it's a very, very um, abrupt assumption. Abrupt is not the, the right word, but it's a very harsh assumption. So, if we think about the model of this, it would be something like this, and now I have some data X here, and I have a set of clusters, and then I have some prior on how or a mixing proportion, if you want, and I have a model of each cluster. Maybe I make this all Gaussian, and it's just a Gaussian mixture model. So the idea now is that we want to try and make k infinite, possibly infinite. So that means we would like this sum here to go towards infinity. So that's a bit of a tricky thing to think about. So this distribution here, in the previous case with the GP, we defined, we talked about a distribution of the functions as a distribution of where does the function cut at a specific slice. The way we're going to think about this now is thinking about this whole object. So this object here says basically the mixing proportions of each, how much do I use of each mixture. And we're going to see that whole thing as a partitioning, as one thing. So what we want to do is that this is a probability, so it needs to sum to 1. So what I do want to do is that I want to find here a partitioning that's possibly infinite of something that goes between 0 and 1. Yeah? Okay. So now, say here, in this case, uh, I'm going to try and just get it. Oh, these things you can call pi k. I call them pi k up there. Okay, so now I want to have a. Let me see. Can I have me on there? Oh, okay. So. Now I want to have a distribution over partitioning. So basically something where should something belong. So this point, which cluster should this belong to? So that would be a multinomial distribution, which will have some parameter here, which is says how likely a specific um, identity of a cluster is. Okay, so now I want to find a prior to this, and the conjugate prior for this would just have exactly the same form. And now it has some parameter alpha. And that prior, if I normalize this, I just have something called the Dirchlet distribution. And the Dirchlet distribution is used, if you think, in the simplest case, it's just an extension of the beta distribution to more dimensions. So instead of thinking a beta distribution is between 0 and 1, a Dirchlet distribution, if you've got three, it's just 
on the three singlets, and it just has one position on there. And then you just increase this, the dimensionality of this simplex. So what we want to do is basically make this distribution infinite. And this is actually quite tricky to write down. But what we can do is we can think of this. We can write down the generative process for this. So this is normally the one that's explained first in terms of Bayesian non-parametrics. And I think that's because computer scientists like this. And as I'm a vehicle engineer, I think GPs makes more sense. It's usually, oh, sorry. If I sample from a Dirichlet distribution, I just get, these are just partitioning, sorry. So it's normally explained like this. This, I think, is the best explanation of them. And this is called the Chinese restaurant process. And if you run this algorithm, so I'm going to explain an algorithm to you, you are going to generate a partitioning that has p potentially infinitely many number of elements. So the way it works like this is that we have a customer who walks into a Chinese restaurant. There's infinitely many tables at this restaurant. And when it sits down at a specific table, it samples a dish. And everyone that sits at this table will eat that dish. Okay? So now you have to think about this in terms of clustering. It's like saying, I now see a new data point. I have a set of clusters. The parameters, the dish that they ate, is the parameters for that cluster. So which one explains me best? There might be a cost. The easiest, the best mixture model is if you make one mixture per data point, right? Well, that's going to explain the data really well. So there's a cost associated to going to a new table. And the way this works, it only has one parameter, is this. So the person, the customer, comes in. The first one sits at a table. Let's just make that the first. Then picks a dish. Second one comes in. Can now make the choice. Should I sit at the first and join this person? Do I like this food? Does these parameters explain me? Or should I go and open a second one? So in this case, open a second one, sample some data. Now we can run this algorithm for a while. I'll explain what, how the choice is actually made. And we're going to get a population, a number of people sitting at each table. The tables have infinite capacity as well. It's a very interesting restaurant. Um, so, the way we're going to do this is that n here is the number of people that are currently in the restaurant. Alpha is the parameter that we control our prior with. So now, you come in, you choose a new table with this probability here. And you can see, as n grows, this is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. So eventually, you are going to stop. But this is never going to go down to zero as long as alpha isn't zero. So you have the potential always to open a new table. So if you don't go to a new table, you're going to pick a table which is proportional to the number of people sitting at that table. So if you're a new data point, now you have one cluster that explains lots of data. Well, it's kind of beneficial to go to that table for some sense. So there's a rich get rich behavior of this, which you can argue is right or wrong. I say it's probably quite a good dish they've chosen there. Right? They've chosen good parameters, if you want to. OK, so if we do this for a new person, now we have nine people sitting here. So I pick, I open a new table with this probability, and I go to another table with this probability. So say now, in this case, I went here. Now there's nine. That does sum up the nine. So now I'm going to go with five ninth probability here, one ninth there, and three ninths there. And if you keep running this algorithm, you are going to get partitionings of an infinite set. So I did some runs of this. So here I set the value of alpha to one. So now you can see it tails off very, very quickly. So then I got for five.
500 customers, five tables opened, and I got 300 and something people sitting at the first table. If I change alpha to two, I get this kind of distribution. If I change alpha to 10, I get this. So this parameter here allows us now to control a partitioning of a set into possibly infinite number of objects. And that's quite cool. Yes? Where does this effect come from that you have these like, huge gaps between those spikes? Oh, um, so it shouldn't matter at all uh, because, like, so when you use this distribution, that's a good, I'll mention this first and then I'll come to it, is that I haven't said anything specific about the table until I pick. So this thing is interchangeable. So you can see, in this case, it doesn't say table one doesn't mean anything. It's just a table. It's just this is how things are split up. So the reason why this happens, that is an interesting question. I there shouldn't be anything in that because you're doing an independent draw, but as you get this thing at the rich get richer, as soon as someone starts getting a couple of more people, and right in the beginning, if you're lucky to get two or three, you're going to grow. So if I ran this, let's say, infinitely often, then I would probably get an order. Yeah. Okay. You should, no, you wouldn't get, you have, oh, yeah, yeah, if you order them. No, on average, because the first table yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, good point. Exactly. Yeah, you should. You should. Uh, so that is how a Chinese restaurant process works. And it's, yeah, very algorithmically, and there's several other constructive proofs for it as well. Okay, so when, when are we taking a break? We could do one more if you want. Um, now's a good break point. I'm going to try and... <laughs> Actually, yeah, let me do this. If I can run a little bit on this, then I'll set the scene for the stuff that's coming next. I'm just going to explain very briefly uh, the idea of what the models that we're going to talk about. Okay, so what I'm really interested in, which <coughs> is what I've worked on most of my career, is unsupervised learning. And, oh, I was used to, so now, I want to use these non-parametric models for performing unsupervised learning. So in the supervised case, I parameterized, I said my model of the data was somehow in the end parameterized by these pairs of data where the question that I'm asking is, if you know the input, what's the output? Right? There was some form of relation I tried to do. And that, I used, in most cases, I used to assume that this is known without noise. So this is the case that I'm interested in. So now I only have y, and I want to find a parameterization of y in terms of some x. Okay? This is when assumptions becomes really, really important. Because in this case, you, I said, well, however many x, y combinations you give me, I can always come up with infinitely many functions that goes through this. And one of them is going to be aliens in Dorset. So I need to make a sensible assumption in order to reason about this. Okay, we got that. This case is even more interesting because it's even more unregulated. Now you're saying, if I have a data point, give me an input to a function and the function that have generated this. So that's like saying, well, I'm clearly standing here now. Give me a starting location and a way I got here. Right? You can find quite a few of them. So without making assumptions about this, you really are stuck. Right? So if we schematically think of that problem, it's like an abacus. So I have given y values and... I don't know what the x value is, so I have these values, and I'm, my task is to slide these along to a position and then connect the function through them. That's the task. Yeah? So I can do that in quite a few ways, like that is one way, that's another way, and oops. 
So now, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do this. The way we are going to regulate this problem, first time, is that we're going to place a prior on the function that this generates. Right? So I am now saying I'm going to position these x's so that they follow a function that I like. And I do that by clearly specifying a Gaussian process prior that defines the type of functions that I like. So here, I think this is, I'm not sure if it's the same data. Here, I've placed them like this. And now, I can use fit a Gaussian process to this. And now, I can use compute how likely this one was. I can position them like this. And I can compute how likely they were. And I can do them like this. And I can see how likely they were. <laughs> And because now I have this distribution that provides me with the structure of the space of functions, I now actually have a problem that I can solve. Right? Used up to my assumption. Again, the scientific principle, my hypothesis is that the data is generated like this. I formulate that in a prior. I see some data. I get the posterior. No, that function doesn't work. Cool. Now I've verified or not verified my principle. Cool. So this one is something that the GP does not like at all. I said I wanted a smooth thing, and this one really has to go to fit that data. This one, it likes quite a bit more. This one here, I think, is the worst one. It basically says, actually, I really hate doing this with the, with the prior that you specified, because you said you wanted a very smooth function. And to make that smooth, I really need to shoot up and model something here, because otherwise I have to cut incredibly quickly here if you want the same smoothness. And you had a prior that said, well, it's zero mean and something around here. Or maybe it was even there. So it really dislikes that one. Cool. So now what I'm interested in doing, we'll add one element to our marginalization, is that now I have P of F which was this Gaussian process. I picked the x's. So now, that was just the Gaussian distribution. I have a Gaussian likelihood. I could integrate out f, no problem. So now, that's my belief in the prior. So then, if I have a prior on a smooth function, I can always make any set of points super smooth by just putting them like one at every infinity or something, right? It's basically, I can make a line out of pretty much any, right? So I also need a prior on this that regulates somehow where the x's are positioned. Cool, so simple. That should not be too hard to do. Possibly a Gaussian of saying they should have this range would work. So easy then. I have this, I have this. The priors are somehow balanced. One thing will do one thing but not stop for the other. One, one, each of these priors has one way of escaping, but each one of them pushes each other back. So now, let's just churn the handle on this. Simple. We just compute this integral. So this is when it becomes a bit tricky. So the GP prior, say that I now have a covariance function. So this is a Gaussian. I have a covariance that's computed at x, which is k. So that's proportional to something that looks like this. So there's a k inverse inside an exponential. right? Each element of this k is where the x's come in. And those are, as well, stuff that sits in an exponential. So now, let's just think. You have an exponential that sits in an inverse of a matrix that mixes every possible element. Do you really want to compute that integral? You do. Mark wants to. Well, you, oh, yeah, sorry. And then, <laughs> after you're done with that, you're now going to push that thing, that x, into another Gaussian, so into this exponential. And then you get it out on y. 
So that's kind of the function that we're dealing with if we want to integrate out x. So x goes through this non-linearity until it gets to y. And that's a bit of a tedious thing to do. It's actually analytically intractable. This integral um, is interesting. So it has infinitely many terms in the normalization. So you can't write that thing up. So Laplace has said something good about everything. And he also said not nature laughs at the difficulties of integration. Um, so now, then I think now is a good time to take a break. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to explain how you can actually approximate that integral and still learn. And then I'm going to say, cool, what can we actually do with this p of x? Because p of x, in the approximation that I'm going to do, appears in a really, really cute way, which means I can do pretty much whatever I want with it. It's really, really nice. And I'm going to show a couple of things that we've done with this that are quite useful. Uh, and then I am, among other things, putting Dirchlet processes on them. And then I'm going to come to and talk a little bit about deep GPs and uh, have some intuition, hopefully, about that. Cool. But well, let's take a break then. So, uh, man Manfred did variational base, right? Uh, yes. So, does that mean I should give the call explanation because no one understood what Manfred did? So, I'll do it again. Okay, cool. Manfred did it in a very Manfred way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, fantastic. I was told, don't be afraid if people leave in, in the you know, middle thing. And I see pretty much everyone still here. That makes me very happy. Uh, so, uh, now, let's just do this learning bit then. So, cool. So, I know Manfred was here talking about variational base last time. So, I'm going to do... So this is either I can do this because I know Manfred explains it the way it really is, which is probably really complicated. I explain as much as I understand, which I think is about what you need in order to be able to use it. So either I think, yeah, should I give the call explanation? Yeah. Cool, I'll do that. So this is the object that I want, P of Y. So this is Y as my data. I've integrated out the whole lot. Cool. We are going to work in log space, so I'm going to take log p of y. Now, what I'm going to do is that I am going to say that p of y is y comma x. You remember this whole model that I had before. Now, I'm going to say x here is the parameter that I want to integrate out, which is intractable. So, I can't compute this integral, but I can still write it. Nice. Now, I can do the chain rule, or the product rule, on, on p of y given x, and write that out as the posterior times this object here. So obviously, these now both of these are intractable, because to reach that one, I need to do base rule, which means I need this one. So this is just nonsensical to write, but we'll see. So now I do that. I'm now going to do this strange step where I say, I'm just going to add a distribution Q. I add it in both sides, so I haven't done anything. Uh, it's a distribution. That's the only thing I've said. And I get this. Now I'm going to do a bound on this integral. That's my aim here. This is an equality, and I'm going to do a bound. So the way I'm going to do the bound is to exploit Jensen's inequality. And hopefully everyone knows this, but just a quick wrap up. If I have a convex function, if I take anywhere, this line would always be above, right? So what that actually means is this, if I move along the line. Uh, so if you think about it, if I take any function value here and evaluate the function, or if I take the function value here and the function value there and slide along it, this will always be above. So what that means 
in terms of expectations, which is what we'll use, is that the expectation of f of p of x is, so now I have a function of x, if this here is a convex function, this here is a lower bound, the function of that integral on this. So then we don't have a convex function, but we have a log, which is just convex the other way around, which just means everything flips. So this argument here flips. So what I'm going to exploit in this case is that I'm going to say if I have the log of an integral, if I move the log inside the integral, that's a lower bound on that. And that's what I'm going to use. So come back to the equation that we had before. Now I'm going to move the log in, and I'm going to move the log in in a bit peculiar way. So I'm going to move the log in there, and move one of the qx's inside the log, but keep one outside. Okay? So now this is a lower bound. And then this is just integrated over x. So this thing here I can just move out. Right? So I get qx dx log p of y, and then I get this thing left here. So this thing here just integrates to 1, so this is just log p of y. And this thing here is the KL divergence between negative KL divergence between Q of x and P of x given y. Yeah? Cool? Uh, now I have an interesting expression here. So I have log P of y, log P of y, and I have a bound. Uh, this thing here is always positive. It's not symmetric. It's not a metric. But it's a measure of similarity. And the only time it's zero is if these two are the same. So if that one is zero, which means q of x is equal to p of x given y, log p of y is equal to log p of y, which is not particularly surprising. So what we can say, that means that this bound is tight. So that means if I pick q of x, to be the same as the posterior p of x given y, this is a tight bound. So what, therefore, I want to do is I want to find the distribution q of x that is as close to this as possible. Right? So, right. Donc, là. Oh, yeah. So what I'm basically trying to say, I'm going to call q of x the variational distribution. So what this means then, that the variational distribution are approximations to intractable posteriors. I said this was intractable. And I think this is not normally the way people derive a variational base. And I still haven't finished. Because, but I think this is important because people normally start off and say, I'm going to minimize the KL divergence between these two. The reason why you do that is because you use the Jensen inequality in this way. The, you don't do the KL divergence and that creates a bound. It's the other way around. It's your inequality that induces the KL divergence. And I think that's an important difference. Cool. So what we're going to do is that we're going to try and minimize this. This we're going to specify. This I don't know. So it's not particularly useful. So we're going to now do the derivation one step back. So now I have q of x, long q of x, p of x, y. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to write this back to the joint. So I'm going to take p of y uh, up here, and I'm going to write this as the joint distribution. So if I do that, I'm ending up with this, q of x, q of x, p of x given y, or oh, comma y, the joint distribution, and I get log p of y out there again. So this thing here, I can rewrite as, if I split this log into a sum of q of x log q of x, that's the entropy of q of x, and then I have q of x, and I flip the sign of that one, so I get a minus. This here is the expectation over q of, over log joint distribution over my approximate distribution. Okay, Now I'm going to flip these things around a bit again. 
and I'm going to put log p of y on one side. So I got log p of y is equal to the KL divergence, which was what I had on the left hand side before, plus this thing here. And this thing here is now called the evidence lower bound. P of y is the evidence. This thing here is always positive. So as long as I maximize this thing here, I am effectively minimizing this one. I'm pushing this thing. So if I find the Q of X, we know if Q of X matches this thing, it's an equality. So if I now push this up as much as possible, I'm going to minimize this. And that is variational base. Oh, what happened there? Uh, uh, presentation. There we go. Cool. So I'm going to write this as this. So this expectation here is just the evidence lower bound. We're just going to call L of Q of X. So in effect, now, this leads us to some very nice things. If we maximize the elbow, we find an approximate posterior, Q of X. That's great, because posterior is prediction. That's actually the object that we really want if we want to use the model. I get an approximation of the marginal likelihood, or the evidence in this case, and that's basically learning, if you want. What we want to do when we learn is to maximize the probability of the data. So this seems like a very, very sensible thing to do. So in effect, now, if we have this thing, and the arrows should go in two ways, I have x that generates y, and what I want to do is do base rule to flip that arrow. The problem is, I can't do that. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm now going to cut that arrow away. The dependency is no longer there. And I'm going to try and specify another distribution over x, which is parameterized by theta. There should be an arrow here. Such that this here contains all the statistics that y would do over x. That's the point. That would be the ideal scenario, right? If we could. Good. So why then, if I haven't voted at you yet, Ryan Adams did this talk show called Talking Machines, talk show podcast, and he, when he talked about variational base, he said some really nice things. So why is this a sensible thing to do? Well, the first thing is, if you can't formulate a joint distribution, which is what we need to take the expectation over, well, then you're in bigger problem than trying to do inference. You don't even have a model. So work on your model first. Second thing is, we're taking an expectation of a log of a distribution. We normally have distributions that have exponentials in it. Logs of exponentials are usually easier than exponentials, so that's probably an easier thing to do. And then, and most importantly, you're allowed to choose the distribution Q that you integrate over. So you can choose this so that you can actually compute the integral. And that's very, very useful. So that's what Ryan said, and I think I agree with him. So now, let's go back to the GP scenario. So now my joint distribution was y, f, x, right? And I wanted to integrate that. So if we now, that's the whole thing that I want. So cool. I know that the joint distribution factorized like this, my likelihood, my prior over the function, and my prior over the latent space. And then I split this thing up where I take P of X, Q of X, and Q of X out here, and I basically get the KL divergence between Q of X and the prior over X. And that kind of is then a measure of saying if this approximates the posterior, how similar is the posterior to the prior? So how likely I think this should be. So if Y is completely uninformative, well, then you don't have a particularly good model. And if that's the case, this should just fit. And then we have this term left here. Cool. So now I'm going to remove this thing and work with this object, because this object is going to become rather big soon. So I'm just working with this, and we can assume that we can compute this. If we can't do that, we're in trouble. So the problem is with this 
is I haven't really helped my problem at all because this is still an integral over x and x appears non-linearly to y. So it's still a rather complicated way to do it. So now we're going to use an ID that was initially proposed in 2005, I think, or maybe earlier than that, by Snelson and Garmani and also Joaquin Candira and Carl Rasmussen had some really nice work on this. But the idea is initially motivated by approximative computation to speed these models up. So what we're going to take, we're going to take a set of points that are going to approximate x. And that's what we're going to work with. Hopefully it will be clear. So what we're going to do, I'm going to pick a new set of points, u. u corresponds to f, and set corresponds to x. That comes from the same prior. So this is the Gaussian process prior. So I'm just going to pick a new set of points that comes from that prior. And then we're going to exploit this. So now, I wrote this up very shortly before, but now because they, I can write the joint distribution here, all function values are jointly Gaussian, as we said, so I can write up the joint of Fu, and now I can reparameterize this, if I want to, where I say, well actually, I write the joint distribution as the conditional distribution where u is given and u comes from just the prior. And u I haven't seen. Okay? Uh, too far away. <coughs> so, literally, we haven't done anything. So now I'm just adding these things into the model. They used new stuff. And I have this. Okay? So, now we're going to do the trick here, which I think the first one who did was Michaelis Titsias and also James Hensman and had some really nice interpretation of this, calling it variational compression. So what we're going to think of as u, and oh, <laughs> xu should be said there, sorry, so the inputs here, we are going to think of them as variational parameters and not random variables. So we're going to see that these points actually are the thing that parameterizes our approximative distribution. So, now remember that the distribution, so we now want everything that we want to integrate out, we want how to specify one of these approximative distributions over. And all of them sh should represent posterior. So Q of U should be this one, Q of F should be this one, Q of X should be this one. Um, okay, so now comes the step or the trick. We are going to say that Q of F here, which should approximate this distribution here, what we're going to do is that we're going to say that U, so the outputs, this is the Y space, this is the X space, the outputs from this the z's to the u's are sufficient statistics for the other points in here. So all the y's. So what this means is that this is the full posterior distribution where I have the observed data, I have the input of the observed data, and then I have these pairs of hallucinated points which are now parameters. And I'm going to say if I have this one, I don't need this one. That's the trick. And it's a very, very big assumption, but I'm going to back myself that I can find use, because these are parameters, that makes this true. And if I say that is true, it has a very, very nice effect. So I can't integrate this thing out, because x here needs to go through f. Cool? Well, here it's clearer. X here doo -doo -doo, needs to go through F to get to Y, and F here is nonlinear. Now, this is the problem here. So now, what happens that I assume 
that u is sufficient statistic for f, which means I'm saying q of f is equal to this. I'm saying that's true. And if that's true, now I write this thing up here. So that's this. Oh, yeah, it's the whole bound. This is the first thing that sits outside. And this is the log. In the log here now, I get this term here, which is my approximate posterior, if you want. And this thing here is the conditional distribution of the GP. And I'm saying now they're the same. And this object here is the thing that ruins everything for me. Because that's the thing that connects Y with X. Right? Through F. And that's really annoying. But now, if I made that assumption of sufficient statistic, they cancel. So now, they cancel to this. And now, I've disconnected X and Y through U under the assumption that it's sufficient statistics. Now, that boils down to this thing. So I need to compute an expectation over this thing, <coughs> and then I got the KL divergence. And then, so now, these expectations are analytically tractable for most covariance functions. And the nice thing is that this is where I wanted to come. Look at where P of X appears. There's no P of X here. There's no P of X here. The only place P of X appears is, is this lonely KL divergence sitting out here. That means that now I can specify really funky priors over X as long as I can compute this. And that's very, very cool. So for example, you can say that this thing here is a Gaussian process in itself. Well, now you just get a deep Gaussian process. You can say that it's a some form of Markov model. Now you get what we call the dynamic Gaussian process. You can do all sorts of funky things. And that's really, really useful. Uh, and I don't think it's been exploited sufficiently. So then comes this thing about light and space priors. So now we're going to try and use that. So was that clear, the variational derivation of things? Reasonably? Yeah? No. <laughs> Well, Manfred, Manfred, I'm sure, did a much better job. <laughs> um, cool. The key thing we need to get from that bound, that what the bound allows me to do is I can work with the distribution of x. So, doo -doo -doo. so one thing that I want to do, this was what I did mostly during my PhD, was that I want to find some data and I want to explain this data using a set of different parameters. I want to factorize this, the variations I see, into a set of different variables. We usually call this factor analysis, and it's a terribly ill-constrained problem. There, I think that's actually what Chomsky refers to when he called the inductivist fallacy. People do things like PCA, or which is used the factor analysis model on data, and then they start interpreting the vectors without knowing that this is only in relation to assuming that the latent variable is Gaussian. But that's exactly some of these things. So what I'm going to do is it's really, really hard to come up with a way of how data should factorize. So what I want is that I want a specific type of model that says, I have two sets of variations of something. And now I want to find a latent variable representation that separately models everything that exists in both separately from the stuff that it only exists in one. Yeah? So for example, if you have me as a silhouette image and a color image. Well, there's stuff that's shared between these two views, if I call them that. My shape doesn't change particularly much. You can generate one from the other. But if you only have the silhouette, you have to add some color to it. Yeah? So I'm going to 
show you a way how you can do supervision that leads to those types of models. Because it's really, yeah, it's basically, if I know how to separate things, I can just inform it, but that's a bit too strong. So I'm going to use an example. This is the coil data set, which contains lots of objects that sit on turntables. So I'm now going to use what I call an alignment to present the data. I'm going to say that this is view 1 and this is view 2. And this and this are somehow corresponding. I'm saying these two things are the same. In this case, it's a duck and a cat. What they have the same is that they both have the same rotation. That would mean if I provided this information and learned a variable, a latent variable representation, I like it to be factorized like this. Shared among them is the facing direction. Private for this one is the duck appearance, and private for this one is cat appearance. If I align them in a different way, so here I move, I have duck and duck, but I randomize the order of these. Now I would want them to do this. Well, the rotation is not shared, but cat and duck appearance is shared. So these would be a really efficient model, because think of now in the concept of explaining away. If I know this variable, it explains away all rotations. So all these images, if you want, become rotated in the same way. And I've got loads of examples of cats and ducks. And this variable should be really efficient to parameterize just the appearance of ducks, cats and ducks. If I don't have them separately, well, now I need to learn ducks in this rotation. That's the idea. Okay? I can also do this, where I say one view is a classification label. So in this case, I'm going to use the word that the variance that exists here in the image, but doesn't exist here, that's irrelevant for the task of classification. The information that exists in the label, but doesn't exist in the image, that's ambiguous. And the information that exists in the image and in the class, that's what's relevant. So in that case, this is feature extraction from this task. And now I'm going to use a Gaussian process to do this. So that will be quite simple. I would now have two Gaussian process priors, two observations that I aligned in some way. And then I just learn these variables by the way that we've seen before. I still haven't done much to the problem because these x's are still separated. How do I know should this one be 3 and this 5 and 11 or what should they be, right? So the way we get around that is that we say, well, actually, there is only one latent space. But you have a vector here that projects this space differently based on which one you generate. Now, if this says a diagonal thing, it basically, if a value here is zero, it doesn't use that dimension of x. So now, if you take w1 and w2 and lie them next to each other, if it has a 1 in both the same dimension in x, that's a shared thing. And if it's zero in one and non-zero in the other, it's private to that view. And this is something that you can do. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'll have to tell this story. So I thought, we thought we did this and thought we were all sorts of clever. Uh, and then someone pointed out quite nicely, there's a paper from 1958 that formulated exactly this thing. They didn't do it with Gaussian processes and they didn't have a variation of bound and all sorts of things. There's a line in that paper that says, this method is so complicated, so to fit it to data would require the use of an electronic computer. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and that paper is called Inter-Battery Factor Analysis, and it's very cool. So the idea is that if you're defending a harbor, how should you make the cannons overlap to kill as many people as possible, I guess? Uh, cool. So if you do that, now I'm just giving one example of this, because we're sadly running out of time. So here I took the oil data set, just for the fun of it. So I've got seven uh, dimensional um, latent space that I learn. 
I have one view, which is the labels, and one view, which is the actual oil stuff that we see. So now, this is the Ws. So what this says is that the blue, all these dimensions, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7, generates the data that I see. This is oil flow, I think, in pipes or something. These two are the ones that are generating the labels. So that means if I want to classify oil data, I can just explain away these. I don't care about this. This is variations in the oil that has nothing to do with the class. Remember, this is not dimensions in the oil data, though. It's dimensions in the latent space that get non-linearly transformed to represent the oil data. So now, if you look at the dimensionality of this, you've got three classes. That's how it looks. If you can't classify that, well, then you're in trouble. Right? That should be the easiest thing ever to classify. However, in the seven-dimensional data, so in the original data, it's a bit more complicated. Not particularly much, but it's, yeah, complicated. <sighs> that doesn't look... Okay. Why does that look so bad? Sorry about this. Um, okay, I'll try and explain this, even though the image looks terrible. Um, this is a new thing that we're going to present at NIPS in a workshop. So it's still early days. Here we combine a, when I said I have two views, I said I have a kernel, a GP each to these two views. How do I know it's two views? Maybe it should be, this one should be divided into three. And maybe someone else should be divided into a different way. How do I know this? How do I know how to partition the data? I don't. We used do that by hand, and then we learn a latent representation. Well, you can also argue that you should learn the partitioning, and you should find the partitioning that maximizes how shared the information is, for example. could be one way. Well, we've talked about priors over partitioning. So what you do now is you put, <laughs> this is very unclear, here. You have a Dirchler process, and the Dirchler process itself now generates kernels. So now, each dimension of the data set walks in and says, cool, can I eat at your table? No, I don't like that food, I'm going to go to this one. Where the dishes that they eat are actually kernels. And this is quite cool, because now you can, if you want, have infinitely many kernels. So you automatically learn the kernels that you need, which is quite useful. Cool. Oh. Really sorry. Uh, so, uh, you can also do exactly the same approach with a topic model. So here is something that we call inter-battery topic models. So now, if you know topic models, or LDA, they basically learn a histogram and says, what, how should I partition a histogram to find distributions of words which explain different topics? Well, you have exactly the same shared and private behavior between topics. So if I now, for example, give one text, we tried this, uh, for example, on a data set where they have Israeli and Palestinian news reporting the same thing. Now you have certain things which are shared, basically exactly the thing that happened, while the opinions are completely private, right? They would explain what happened in a different way. And it's actually quite interesting. Uh, we have used this in the most interesting case for this thing, which is hopefully something that comes up online in Sweden. This is, when people come, most people actually go to a hospital and say, I have pain here. And it's just unidentified pain. They, they don't know where it came from. And then what usually happens is that someone looks at them and says, I have no clue, go to this doctor. And then you just walk around this system, and you just get worse and worse and worse, and then you have all sorts of pain. So the idea was that now you could make these drawings. So you let people draw on a body like this and say, this is where I have the pain, the color would show the intensity and so forth. And then we will have doctors label this drawing corresponds to these 
like this is diagnosis, patterns, all sorts of things that the doctors wanted out from this. Then there's stuff in here because there's not just this drawing, this class. People can have lots of different things, right? So there's top things here which are shared with different kind of diagnosis and so forth. So you can actually learn that and that works fantastically well. So here we have a thing somewhat, possibly not that hard, but someone's drawn this and actually here we have what we predict and this is exactly the ground truth, so this will be perfectly right. It can sometimes be completely bizarre things like this, like this person have probably hurt himself really badly. Um, and you do reasonably well, and it works well enough that they actually want to put this online for people to just draw one, which would be very cool. Cool. So, now, let me see. Uh, yeah? So you spoke about basically having uh, the possibility of learning the kernel, but you're yeah. learning the kernel function, like the parameter. No, exactly. Like exactly. So it's basically a selection problem instead, right? I can, very good. So I now have to turn it into you have a set of possible covariance functions that you can pick and obviously you can pick two with different parameter settings we can see them as two different covariances if you want but we can't come up with covariance functions that would be very cool if we could yeah exactly exactly so so it's like it's somewhere there, so people have done in Cambridge, I think it was at Cambridge then, so, so the idea where this was motivated from, oh, obviously it was in Cambridge, Subin and David Duvenot and these people did, was it called the automated statistician, was the idea, which was basically a kernel selection problem. But they had a super greedy approach to do this, right? They were basically, is this one better than this? Do, 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 do. It's really cool, like they tried to specify, the first thing was a, how do you say, not a topology, ontology of kernels. And it's really cool work. And what we thought, well, actually, you can put this non-parametric prior on top of this, and we can try and basically marginalize the whole thing out instead. Which, you know, we, at the moment, though, the selection of this, the only thing it does, it selects from a set of things, right? But I think it has the potential of actually walking down and be used in the automated statistician, which is something that we want to do. But <laughs> uh, I think those results, the first really decent results that we get out came last week or two weeks ago or something. So it's very recent work. Cool. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about some other very recent work, which I'm going to relate. I really hope the images look better here. Uh, which I'm going to come to a more philosophical conclusion in the end. I really hope I have time for that. Uh, so, now, if I look at Wikipedia uh, and look at what scientific modeling is, it basically says, understands referencing, blah, 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 blah. you want to understand the world by referencing it to, to accepted knowledge. To me, that's base rule, where this is my accepted knowledge and this here is how I reference it and this is now how I've updated my understanding. So now hierarchies have become terribly popular in machine learning. People have started putting models into models and sure that seems like a sensible thing to do sometimes these neural network IDs so, I don't really know why, but people do that. Um, so, sometimes you actually have data which is naturally hierarchical. And then, when I want to take the accepted knowledge, it comes in a hierarchy. So, in order to use that knowledge as much as I can, to make as many assumptions as I can, that's what we want to do, I need to build hierarchical models. So, in this case, we have data that a big German company that starts with an S and ends with Emens um, uh, have put us on. And I can't say what it is, but we have an interesting problem is that we have several units sitting like this. 
And each of these units communicate in one way or the other. And I know a little bit about the communication. I know that the communication comes from one end and it goes out the other end. And I have, I know that this one will know everything first affect the stuff that goes on here and then it moves down. Right? I also know that there's engineers that built each one of these and they know loads about them. Okay? So if I now try and model this as an input-output system, I can't use their knowledge. I can't make assumptions. But if I make a hierarchical model that provides a handle for assumption, 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 now I can use their knowledge and learn from less data. So, the way this model works is that I have a signal coming in, which I call X. Then this signal goes through one function, which I call an alignment function. This here takes data and aligns it in different ways. It warps it. Then this function here, F, makes a convolution where with W here is some weight and then when it's been convolved here and the interesting thing these weights here are shared over D here D is the dimensionality in this case but it's not that doesn't matter the important thing is this doesn't matter so the convolution is always the same and then there's a final function that warps this again. So now what we want to do is put the GP, a GP, a GP, and a GP, because that's just the sensible thing to do. So then we end up with a model that looks like this. So now I have data coming in here. So this is like one machine, and this is like one machine. The process of these machines, they're actually the same, and that's where the convolution comes in. So now this data needs to be aligned basically say that this one was ahead of time, it needs to jump in time. So this mapping here aligns it. Now it goes into this shared convolution and then it unaligns it, if you want. And when we did this, there's another way of just looking at it where you can basically see it. It's just a deep Gaussian process. It looks a bit simpler there. Cool. If you now do this, this is a toy example of this, you can do some quite cool things. So here is the shared function that we have. And then we have two alignments because it's just two things. We can always make one of these things the identity function because you align things relatively. But now you can do some cool things. So this is my data here. I now have a blue function and this other function. They both use the same shared function. But look at this thing here. Because I've learned the behavior of them, at this point in time, I stop seeing the green data. Bonk. If you model this with the GP, it would just blow up. Right? I have no data, but what can I do? Um, but because we've learned this alignment of these signals, now we can actually pretty much perfectly predict that thing. And that's very, very cool. Uh, we sadly only have toy data for, for this thing. Because it turns out it's really, really hard to train this. And now someone's smiling. <laughs> and um, that is because this was my first uh, time I saw composite functions. And composite functions have become very popular, all the neural network stuff. But they aren't as intuitive as you think they are. And I'm going to try and explain a couple of things. So the first thing, why are they so bloody attractive? Why do they actually learn stuff, right? So when you read a paper in deep learning and they say, we just stacked all these things together without making assumptions and we learned something, that's wrong because you cannot learn anything without making assumptions. They've made loads of assumptions, they just don't know what they are, right? Because otherwise you can't learn anything. It's the no free lunch theorem which you can't break. So, we need to figure out what the assumptions they do make. So, let's, to begin with, let's stop calling them neural network and let's call them composite functions because that's what they are. Mathematicians talked about this for donkey's years. So, we now have a set of functions, donk, they generate some data. So, first thing to know about the function is that we have something called the kernel of a function. The kernel of a function is all points that map to the same value, right? 
The image of a function is the other thing. The image of the function is if we take the whole input domain, what are the values that we can map out to? Yeah? Now, when we do composite functions, these things have this behavior. The kernel of a function can only ever grow or stay the same, which means the number of points that map to the same value continuously grows. If you map two points to the same value, you can never ever find a function that unmaps them. Right? They're the same. So that means you can only ever lose representative capability by making a composite function. Because the representative thing is the image. And the image shrinks. Right? The possible values that you can output continuously get smaller. Right? So, an example of this is this. So, this is a step function. And now I'm going to do some kernel regression on this. So, let's just do this. So, first, I, I can't remember how many basis functions I have, but doo -doo -doo, I learned this, right? These are my weights here. It's a super, most weights are active, and this is what it learned. Cool, this is the first layer. Donk. So now we're supposed to take the y values here and make them inputs in the next function. So now you can see an interesting thing to happen. These two points here, which are pretty much on the same value, have now started spreading out. And these two points here have started shrinking down. We're losing representative power. So now we do that. Dunk. We do that again. Now you see all over here, we're very, very uncertain. Well, that's just because we do kernel regression. So now we've got this, dunk, 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 dunk. We keep doing this, and eventually, all these things are going to end up in two points, right? And that's it. Okay, uh, so that is because we tie things together that are the same. So, yeah, dunk, dunk, dunk. Eventually, it does this. That's why, for example, you can use smooth functions. So here, I've just used the smooth function. If I map this now from x, the original x, I'll get a step function, pretty much, which is, is weird, right? I made a prior on smooth functions, and I get a step function out. Okay, so now let's think more mathematically what's actually happening. So there's something that we use every day, which is the change of variables of probability distributions. Oh, I need to speed up a bit. So if I have a Sorry, I'll show this visually instead. So, the way we use this is this, right? Here I have a beta distribution, the blue one. I want to sample from this distribution. Ooh, I don't know how I do this. So what I do, I compute the cumulative distribution. Dunk. Now, I flip this around like this, and then I sample from a uniform, which I can. I now push that up here, so if I sample, I get this value. Dunk. That means this value, because the gradient here is high in the previous thing. I add a lot of probability mass. This is going to be flat. So now the uniform samples pushed through this thing will generate samples from the beta distribution. That's how we sample. Cool? Right. So what happens if we now take this distribution and sample from it? And this is a function that maps between these two things. Okay. So if I do that, I'm going to end up with this. Cool. So now I sampled from this thing, and I map through here, and I get these blue things. Now I'm going to say, for the fun of it, that each of these blue things represents a couple of classes. So it is like this. The blue is one class, and the red is one class. Now I'm going to try and classify these things. Ugh. That's not very fun because I have my logistic regression, and it doesn't like this because this has like two modes. So this is not good. Well, I just add another function. I do another push of probabilities through another function to transform them. Let's say I use this function, for example. If I do that, pull. now I sample, dunk. I'm going to get this. I've now merged everything from class 1 to be there everything from class 2 to be there. This graph is actually not exaggerated. It's the other way around, because these things actually done this exactly. <laughs> this doesn't fit. So it actually looks like this. 
I've now transformed this data into this. If you can't classify this, then you're in trouble, right? So what have we done now? We have taken data that was between 0 and 1 and had variance, and we compressed it down to two values. That's what we've done. The only part of the image that's left of this function is two values. You can only map to two values, and that's it. Whatever you put in, it's going to get those two values. That's it. Everything else has been tied up together. Right? So, to me, what that means, what we're actually doing when we do composite functions, is that we've all seen this plot when you should select models, you should compute the evidence of the data, you integrate everything else, then there's this bizarre idea of having a complexity of the data. But anyhow, let's say this. Now, if my data is here, I should choose this model because this is complex enough to represent the data. This is too complicated. It represents too much. This is too simple, so it doesn't represent the data. What we've done when we do this type of modeling, all the steps until the last function is folding this space so that nothing exists. There only exists two things, and now you put the probability distribution on that. Great. And you can do that in whatever way you want. Right? So, have I exaggerated this? Because I talked about distributions here. Most people who do this don't use distributions. No, I've actually done the other way around. Because you saw the functions that I used, they were like smooth. People that use neural networks use activation functions, which are very non-smooth, they are basically they want to do step functions. Now what this means, all these points and all these points are mapped to the kernel. And actually everything that goes there and there are now gone. You can't represent them. And that's, to me, why these things work. And that's why you get these kind of behaviors where this is an image correctly classified all the images on this side have been classified as ostriches. So this here is the Frobenius norm between these images. And that's clearly because now you've folded this space so many times on each other. So it just turns out that your function has just split by folding this thing there. That's actually an ostrich. And it ended up where the ostriches were. Right? because you've collapsed this representative power so much. So, that was my rant uh, on these things. But it just, it just is so tiring to just, especially when people put parameters and then they say, oh, we've got so many free parameters, look what we can learn. It's a super complicated model. It's not. It's the other way around. It's simpler. Cool. So, I just wanted to do that connection because this really highlights to me the real importance to do uncertainty modeling when we do composite functions. Because the reason why they need so much data when you do neural networks is that you can never ever fold the data points that are of different classes. So as long as you space this space with data pretty much everywhere, then you're safe. And if your folding is not too deep, you can guarantee that a tiny bit away from the data, you're still going to retain the same class. Right? The way we do this, the way it should be done, is that you place uncertainty around your data, and you're not allowed to fold the probability distribution. However, when you do GPs, that is not particularly trivial, uh, because I've used the mean function that was always zero, for example, well, that means put everything in the kernel. That's my prior. So the mean function starts getting important and so forth. So I just wanted to highlight it's not as trivial as one thinks it is. Cool. So I'm going to do a quick summary of things. So normally, I've done a lot of unsupervised learning here. And normally it said this is like a really hard problem. It's not. It's really, really easy. Unsupervised learning is the easiest thing there is because no one's told you what to do. If you're given some data, you just hand them back the data. Right? That's unsupervised learning if you want to. Relevant unsupervised learning is hard because now we need 
a lot of assumptions and we need relevant assumptions and that means we need tools or handles to input our assumptions. I hope that I explain these two stochastic processes, DPs and DPs. They are very interpretive means of inputting prior assumptions that in most cases are actually quite relevant. You can learn from incredibly small amounts of data because they allow you to make a lot of assumptions really simplistically. Right? And that's our aim, to make as many assumptions as humanly possible. That is machine learning. So composite functions, so composite functions cannot model more things, but they can easily warp an input space so they can model less things. And this, of course, then leads to very high requirements on data, but you can also learn very, very strange and very, very cool things with it. So to me, that means this warping here is why we really need uncertainty propagation here, because otherwise these data requirements will just continuously keep going up. And it's already at the state now where it's quite hard, at least for a university, to do these kind of things. Cool. Um, so we need to think, and I have some ideas, but that would not be a tutorial. That would be discussions for the pub uh, of intuitions of what we can do for priors over hierarchies. Because I don't think the idea that I try to get across is if we make priors, if I have a hierarchy of function, if I make a prior of each function, that thing there is the whole function is absolutely not what you think it is. It's doing something completely different, which means we often, I think we need to think about priors for a whole hierarchy. And that, with that note, I'm going to end. Thank you.